so I'm Heather Sorensen. I am one of the nurse practitioners that works here at the Arthritis Center. And when we had to pick our topics for the year, I asked for osteoporosis because I do enjoy talking about osteoporosis. And if any of you happen to be one of my patients and we've had this talk before, you'll know that I always say that. Oh, I like to do this. So, um, ignore some of the weirdness about how the slides are laying out because when I made them, they were on the right spot. <laughs> I don't know that picture's up. Anyway, welcome. How many of you have ever had a bone density exam? Oh, good. Okay, so that's great. Um, now, I won't say who has osteoporosis because that would be a HIPAA violation. I don't want you to talk about your personal health information in front of other people. But if you do have osteoporosis and have had or are planning to have treatment, some of this will not be new to you because we all talk about it, so hopefully it was part of your introduction to osteoporosis when you had your diagnosis. Okay, so what is osteoporosis? Well, in order to understand osteoporosis, we have to know something about bones, and that is that it's a living organ just like your heart is and your lungs and your skin. They are made up of cells, and cells regenerate and cells die. So bone is just the same. And when we talk about osteoporosis, we have a problem with timing and a sort of a mismatch, so we'll get to that piece. <clears throat> Um, the body removes the old cells, that's called resorption, okay, I'll say that word a lot, and then the body replaces it with new bone, which is formation, okay? When we have osteoporosis and we're having a mismatch of our timing that we'll talk about, we end up with weaker bones, bones that are less dense, bones that have less mass, so they're less strong. So we have a risk for fracture. Okay, so as I was just saying, we have old bone and then new bone, old bone and then new bone. And if the timing is right and your body's working properly, your bone has a nice pace of resorption and formation so it stays even. You know, your body likes to have a calm speed where everything stays balanced. Okay, so here's the mismatch slide. So what happens in osteoporosis is the older cells, the mature cells, the seniors, they're getting reabsorbed and taken out of the body, excreted, faster than the new cells can come in and form new bone. So you're left with pits. And you can see in this picture that on the left side, that is what normal bone looks like. If you were to take a cross section of bone, split it open, you would see what looks like normal bone density on the left, and then once we start having the problem with pits, that's what it looks like on the right. If you were to take a piece of bone on the left and whack it on the side of this counter, it would stay together. If you took the pitted bone and hit the edge of the counter, it would break. So that's a kind of a cartoon way of imagining when people with osteoporosis break a hip or break a wrist. So how do we determine our bone strength or our bone mass? Well, we do bone density exam, okay? But there are some factors that contribute to your density, okay? And that's genetics, that's your family history. Some people have family history of osteoporosis, hip fractures, wrist fractures, others don't medications that you take, and we'll hit on that just a little bit. <clears throat> Your ethnicity, white Caucasian women have higher rates of osteoporosis as do Asian American women. African American people have denser bone. They have less osteoporosis. Um, gender, female greater than male, but men still get osteoporosis. And then age. As I just said, it's more common in women, and it's also more common in women over 50. Generally, it's not seen very often in younger women unless they have other disease states or medications that they take or they have eating disorders. We'll talk about all of that, that cause their osteoporosis. But generally, it's women over 50, men over 70.
Okay, so particularly about women, eight out of 10 million, eight of 10 million Americans with osteoporosis are women. Eight million of the 10 million. One in two women over age 50 will break a bone due to the osteoporosis, spine, wrist, hip. <clears throat> and the female risk for hip fracture is equal to a combined risk of breast, uterine, and ovarian cancers together. So Caucasian women, they have the highest rates. 20% of Caucasian women age 50 and older are estimated to have osteoporosis. Now, this isn't a solid number, but they can estimate it based on the numbers that they do have not all women get screened for osteoporosis. Not all women experience the fracture, because I think really because they just get lucky. But it is an estimated amount. And more than 50% have low bone mass, not quite osteoporosis yet, and we'll talk about that. It's called osteopenia. <clears throat> Caucasian women lose a third of their hip bone density between ages 20 and 80. That's why it's so important for young women and teenage women to be mindful of creating good bone. And then 15% of them are lactose intolerant. So that means they can't drink milk comfortably. They can't eat cheese. They can't eat cottage cheese. They can't consume dairy products that give them calcium. And we'll spend a lot of time on calcium. So African-American, like I said, if we had 20% of Caucasian women, only 5% of African-American women get osteoporosis. Um, Steve, do we have another Steve? How could you see? Okay. 35% um, have low bone mass. They do have lower screening rates, so we're not picking up as much osteoporosis in the African-American women. 70% are lactose intolerant. That makes it really hard to get dairy in the diet, which prevents them from getting good calcium. And they often don't get enough vitamin D either, and we'll talk about the vitamin D. 20% of Asian American women, just like our Caucasian women with osteoporosis. 50% have the osteopenia, or the low bone mass. And 90% are lactose intolerant. Uh, Latino women, a little bit lower rates, 10% with osteoporosis, 50% have low bone mass. Okay, so you think, okay, age-wise, we know it's 50 plus, that has a lot to do with estrogen, it has a lot to do with menopause, and we'll talk about that. Most people begin to slowly lose bone by their mid-30s. So really, all your time up until your mid-30s is important bone-building time. <clears throat> People ask, is there a symptom of osteoporosis? No. Osteoporosis is silent. You often don't know you have osteoporosis until you have a bone density exam or you break a bone. Breaking a bone when you have osteoporosis can happen easily. You could just slip off the curb and fall just wrong and break your hip. You could be walking in your house, step over the dog, fall, break your wrist. I mean, it happens very easily because remember the picture from the beginning of all those pits so the, those bones break. <coughs> when we have hip fracture, when we have spine fractures, those can often lead to long-standing chronic pain disability, sometimes death, over the first year after a hip fracture. So serious things. The osteoporosis doesn't cause the death. It's all the other things that come with immobility. Wrist, hip, spine. Those are the most common osteoporosis fractures. Now, there can be other spots, but these are the most common. So in 2004, the Surgeon General released his report on osteoporosis and said that 20% of senior citizens who break a hip often die within the first year, okay? One third of them will remain in a care facility for at least a year. 
If you've ever known anybody that's broken a hip that's elderly, you understand this. I mean, it's not an easy thing to recover from. Hip fractures account for 300,000 hospitalizations each year. Not all hip fractures are because of osteoporosis. Some happen, you know, car accident, things like that. Wrist fracture, typically it's the radius. Compression fractures are the fractures of the vertebrae. Those are the little pieces that make up your spine. <coughs> when the vertebrae is weak, the bone collapses, and that's what gives you a compression fracture. Very painful. There are procedures for people who have an acute or a right now compression fracture in their back. So it's not something that where the pain has to continue. There are some procedures that can help. We don't do them. It's a radiology or a neurosurgery procedure, but there is some help. But they're often painful for at least six weeks, sometimes more, and some people have long-standing chronic pain related to their spine fractures. And as our bones and our vertebrae get weaker and they start to lose their strength and collapse, then we get our dowager's hump, and that's in the next picture. I think the first one's age 30, the middle one's age 60, and I believe the, the last one's an example of age 80. Okay, so there are risk factors in osteoporosis. There are some that you can't change. Your gender, your age, your ethnicity, these are things we can't change. It's how we came. Um, family history, can't change that. And then small bone structure. Tiny women, petite women, tend to have less bone density. White, Caucasian women. And they tend to have then more osteoporosis. However, there are some things that you can control that are risk factors for osteoporosis. Smoking, alcohol consumption out of moderation, not exercising, not getting your calcium and your vitamin D. Any of my patients here will know that I'm always talking about calcium, vitamin D, exercise, exercise, weight-bearing exercise. Um, poor nutrition, we got to have the things that help our cells grow and reproduce. <clears throat> there are other risk factors. Some of these can be managed because they're disease states. The first one is low levels of sex hormone. That's the estrogen. That's the testosterone. However, once we hit menopause, we can't do much about that. Okay? There is hormone replacement therapy, but that carries its own risks. Hyperthyroidism, that can be medically managed. Other medications like corticosteroids, we use those a lot in our, in our business of rheumatology, and that's why we screen our ladies and our men sooner for osteoporosis than other non-steroid using folks. Chemotherapy that is used to deplete the sex hormones because of the kinds of cancer they have. Breast cancer that's estrogen receptor positive, that's treated with chemotherapy that blocks off the estrogen then you don't have as much, then you have risk for osteoporosis. The oncologists here in town are very good about sending their ladies for bone density exams if they're on anti-estrogen treatment, because they know that too. Um, prostate cancer that's treated with those chemotherapies, same idea. <clears throat> heparin, although with all these new drugs for antiplatelets, not many people use the heparin anymore. Um, some of the seizure medications, okay? Hyperparathyroidism also can be managed medically. So these are things that they may exist, but they can be managed. Okay. Can you inject for that? Yes. There are actually two different parts of your body. The thyroid is a piece, and the parathyroid is a piece. Ultimately, they both end up pulling bone from the from the bone, pulling calcium and minerals from the bone, and wasting them. Okay, so I'm on levothyroxine. That's for hypothyroidism. What is hypothyroidism? That's low thyroid. Oh, 
This is high thyroid. That's a good question, though. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. um, not getting your periods, and that's usually because of eating disorder. So, or younger women who, who athletes, actually, so not just eating disorders, athletes who don't have their periods, that also is a risk factor. Um, people with malabsorption, Crohn's disease, where they can't um, absorb their nutrients properly, also have risk. Okay, so here's the estrogen question. So you get to your perimenopausal state and you're having your high f hot flashes and you're having a terrible time managing your, your perimenopause, often your women's health care provider will prescribe hormone replacement therapy, which helps your body hold on to its minerals better. But there are other risk factors, blood clots, heart attack, cardiovascular disease. So, you know, talk with them about that. They have modified hormone replacement therapy over time after um, other incidents like this so that people are getting less estrogen for a lesser time, which is help, helping the women with their symptoms without inducing as much osteoporosis. Um, touched on the eating disorders already, anorexia, bulimia, when you're not taking in your important vitamins and minerals, or if you're taking them in and getting rid of them quickly, like in bulimia, you're not getting the nutrients that you need. Um, I know none of you are teenagers, but we all have them somewhere, right? Grandkids, kids. Talk to them about it, because like I said, you're, they're building their strong bones right now. This is it. And they only have to about their mid-30s to get the job done right, okay? So calcium, vitamin D, well-balanced diets, getting good weight-bearing exercise, not smoking, and not drinking. All the things we tell them as parents anyway, right? Um, the younger adult women, typically it doesn't happen in women younger than 50 or younger than menopause, but certain medical conditions, certain medications, as we talked about before, will um, bring about an earlier um, osteoporosis or low bone mass, the osteopenia. But we don't usually treat the younger women, the premenopausal women, with the medications. It's just not approved for it. Okay, so in menopause, your estrogen levels drop and that can lead to bone loss. For some women, it can be rapid and severe. Two factors. The amount of bone mass you have when you start your menopausal period of life, perimenopause, if you have more bone mass because you built it really good as a young woman, then you have less risk. The rate of loss after you reach the menopause, some of them lose 20% of their bone density in the first five to seven years after menopause. That's why we encourage women to have bone density exams once they are fully menopausal or earlier if they have an inflammatory arthritis. And that's something we'll talk about down a couple of slides too. Here's the, here's the part for the men. 0 0.8 million men have osteoporosis in the US. Much smaller amounts than women. One in six men's men over the age of 50 will have a fracture related to osteoporosis. 11.8 million men have low bone mass, which is the osteopenia, okay, and are at high risk for fracture than an average male without those scores. Um, there's a lot of text on this slide, but we're going to go through most of the pieces separately, but it's kind of condensed here. Prevention is key. You know, you can't do anything about your gender, your ethnicity, your family history, but you can do a lot with prevention. Good building blocks of bone. That's calcium, that's vitamin D. And we'll talk specifically about the amounts of calcium. Well-balanced diet, stop smoking, um, avoid excess alcohol intake. It says no more than two for women and three for men, but. I think most of the materials now, according to my high school child, he said, no, mom, one for women, two for men. That's what we're teaching. They're teaching us in high school. I said, well, 
wonderful. Okay. Um, being physically active and participating in weight-bearing exercise. The best weight-bearing exercise you can do, walking. It's free. All you have to do is get out there. But that can be the hardest part, honestly, having the motivation to do it. But walking, bearing weight, standing on your feet and moving keeps the minerals in the bones. Swimming doesn't because you're not bearing your weight. Riding your bicycle, no. Dancing, yes. Um, the elliptical and the treadmill, those are bearing weight. <clears throat> tai Chi and yoga are wonderful because you are weight bearing and you're working on strength and flexibility, which helps you with balance, which keeps you from falling, which keeps you from fracturing. And then, of course, get treatment for any underlying condition, like a thyroid or parathyroid problem, for instance. So this is my, my pitch for good exercise. It helps improve your muscle strength and balance, as I just said, which prevents falls and other accidents, <clears throat> keeps your minerals in your bones. Before you start an exercise program, talk to your healthcare provider to see what's right for you in terms of your cardiovascular health and other risk factors that you may have for um, activity. And avoid some of the extreme exercises like marathon running and CrossFit and some of the other um, trendy exercises right now. And most importantly, if you have osteoporosis, we don't want you lifting more than 10 pounds. So if you're in a weight lifting class, that's awesome, but don't do more than 10 pounds because it increases your risk for fracture of the spine. When you have osteoporosis, if you don't, it's all good. Yes, sir. 10 pounds, is that that? Are you talking repetitive, like weight class? Bending over and lifting 10 pounds. If you're sitting... My cat weighed more than 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe, maybe don't... If you have osteoporosis, don't bend at the back and lift him up. Maybe sit and lift him over. But you still have more risk. Your risk is higher for fracture when you are lifting more than 10 pounds if you have osteoporosis. I think this one says itself. Okay, so then how do we get a diagnosis of osteoporosis? How do we find out we have it? Well, either you have a screening bone density, a health promotion activity with your primary care or women's health care provider. They send you, okay, yes, you're fully menopausal. It's time for your screening bone density. So then you go and you have and you found it. Uh-oh, I have osteoporosis. Or you experience your fracture. And then you have your bone density exam. And yes, indeed, your fracture, your osteoporotic. Um, screening should be performed once you're fully menopausal or earlier in the setting of inflammatory arthritis. Our patients with rheumatoid arthritis, we, we get their bone density exam earlier than 50 if they have very high risk factors. Lots of steroid therapy, for instance. Okay, so according to the National Osteoporosis Foundation, who are the gurus of osteoporosis, there are some rules or some guidelines on who should be tested. Women greater than 65, men greater than 70, regardless of risk factors. Everybody in the whole wide world should have a screening bone density at 65 if women, 70 if men, no matter the risk factors. Younger postmenopausal women after menopause and men ages 50 to 70 with risk factors, okay? Adults with rheumatoid arthritis are taking medications associated with low bone, bone mass or osteoporosis like the Femara, the Arimidex, you know, those, those chemo agents that were on the other slide, heparin, seizure medications, those things. Anyone being treated or being considered for treatment of osteoporosis, that one seems like a silly one on there because you'd think that you'd have the bone density before we'd talk about putting you on medicine for it, right? <clears throat> and then postmenopausal women who are stopping their estrogen therapy because they'll need something to protect their bones once they're off the estrogen that was protecting their bones. Yes. Uh, if you have your test when you're 70, you have to repeat it. 
80? We'll talk about that too, but if you have normal bone density, you don't have to have it repeated for 10 years. If you have osteopenia, depending on some of the other scoring, that determines your next one. If you have osteoporosis, we do it every two years. Okay? We'll do it every two years when you have osteopenia also. So this is the bone density exam. It's quick, it's painless, it happens right in our office or if people are from out of town, they get it done at their community hospital. Um, there's other folks here in town that will send their folks to one of the radiology departments. They do them too. The women's health um, practices, I believe, have their own bone density machines. It's really, I say 10 or 15 minutes, but really I sent a lady today and it was like five minutes. It felt like five minutes. There is another bone density screening device called a calcaneal or heel ultrasound. If you've ever been to a health fair, maybe they did this little heel bone density measurement on you. And then that's just a screening tool. We don't use those results to determine whether we're going to treat you with medications or other things. What that tells us is that you should have a whole bone density exam. So it's just a screening tool. So you might see that at a health fair because it's cheap, it's easy to carry. Okay, I'm pretty proud of this slide because my 13 year old helped me make it. Okay, so when you have a bone density exam, you get a piece of paper, your healthcare provider gets a piece of paper with some scores on it. And we call those T-scores. And those are what help us determine what your bone density status is, okay? So in the green, all the green is normal bone density. So if you imagine a, a thermometer of sorts, a continuum, from a minus one, all the way to all the positive numbers, that's normal bone density. If you have a score that's between minus 1.0 and minus 2.5, so up to minus 2.5, once you get to 2.5, it's osteoporosis, but minus 1 to minus 2.4 then is osteopenia or low bone mass, okay? And then we have several things we look at when we have that number. When we have the red zone, that's osteoporosis, and once you get minus three, that's severe osteoporosis. So I tried to use the green for good, yellow for, you know, maybe we need to do something, and red, we definitely do something. And a lot of times in my exam rooms, I have this little piece of scratch paper that I've been working with, so now I'll be replacing it with this, because it's much better. Okay, so what, is, what does the number stand for? If you've ever seen a bell curve, you know, you have the numbers in the middle and then everything else becomes a standard deviation from the middle zone. So a minus one on that arrow is equal to about 10% bone loss. Minus two, which is still the osteopenia, you're still in the yellow, 20% bone loss, bone mass loss. Minus 2.5 is 25%, and that's when we get to be osteoporosis. And then further down the line, that corresponds, minus 3 is 30, minus 4 is 40%. Imagine losing 40% of your bone mass. I mean, you better not be walking around anything that's not flat, right? You don't want to fall and break. Um, the score sheets that come back from the bone density, density exam vary by sight. These are just some examples. They're just generic ones. But these are what we look at as providers to interpret what your scores are. So it'll show the piece of your spine that we measure. It's L1 through L4, the low back. We measure the femoral neck, which is kind of this inset here. And then we calculate the total femur. They're each given a score, so three sites. Unless you have an artificial hip, and then we can't count it anymore. And a lot of times then we use a forearm. We don't particularly care for the forearm because we don't think it's as accurate, but if that's all we have, then that's what we use.
Okay. So what if your score is my? Yes, ma'am. When you have artificial hips, uh huh. You have to do forearm. You do before the person is going to have both hips done. Hopefully, hopefully. A lot of times we don't have that sort of planning ability, but um, if, if they do have a baseline hip score and we know that they're going to get their hip replaced, but only one, then we'll do, start doing the right side then. Okay, if we know they have both, then we do our best. Except Medicare will only let you have a bone density every two years. So if you just had one last year and now you're going to have your hip, well, you just had one last year then, so you have a baseline. But we didn't know it last year and we didn't have the forearm, so we do our best. Um, okay, so if you have a score from minus 1 to minus 2.5, how do we make that score meaningful? Well, we have a special tool. So the FRAX tool was designed to help us in situations like this where we're not sure. Do we treat? Do we not treat? What's the risk? What should we do? So they made this tool and it factors in your gender, your risk factors, your age, your medicines, plus your T-scores and gives us a risk for the next 10 years of any major osteoporotic fracture and what your risk for hip fracture is in 10 years. So it's a probability. And this is what the tool looks like. Our bone density machine calculates it automatically so we don't have to fill it in, but other places may not have this built into theirs and so they use this tool that's available online. And it takes your age, your gender, your weight, your height, whether or not you've had a fracture before, whether you're a smoker, if you're taking steroid therapy, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, because the rheumatoid arthritis is an independent risk factor for the development of osteoporosis. That's why rheumatologists take care of osteoporosis. Then it figures in um, whether or not we think you have secondary osteoporosis. Secondary would be from the steroids. Um, alcohol, three or more drinks in a day, and then your T-score and then it takes it all and it shuffles it through their mathematical spinner and it comes out with a percent, okay? However, sometimes FRAX isn't applicable. If we already have a fragility fracture, a fall from standing height, FRAX doesn't count. You have osteoporosis, period, the end. If you have a person that's already getting treatment for osteoporosis or osteopenia, you no longer use the FRAX. If their T-scores are normal or if they're osteoporotic, we don't use the tool. Men under age 50, because it's just not designed to fit that population. If you haven't reached menopause, we don't use it. Kids, and then there's the femoral neck question, which falls back to the false hip. If you have two hips that are replaced, we can't use FRAX because it uses the femoral neck, the, the second T-score. And if you don't have a femoral neck anymore, we can't use it. Uh, it's a fracture risk analysis. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. so. There are two ways to earn the designation of osteoporosis. One is by T-score of minus 2.5 or worse, so we get closer to the threes, or a fragility fracture, fall from standing height. You're just standing in your living room, walking across the room, you fall over and you break your hip. That's a fragility fracture, okay? You're just standing there, you tip over, you fall, you break your wrist. That's a fragility fracture you very nearly always will have osteopenia or osteoporosis on T-score with that. However, I think it probably is possible, though I don't know the statistics to have close to normal bone density, but I just don't think so. I just, pathophysiology-wise, doesn't make sense to me. So either way, you get the, the designation. Compression fractures are those kinds of fractures, too. Some women, 
with osteoporosis that don't know it, bend over to pick something up, get a compression fracture. It's acute, it's sudden, and it's painful. Okay, so then what? Well, there isn't a cure for osteoporosis. However, we can manage osteoporosis, and by managing it, we prevent further bone loss, so hopefully prevent recurrent fractures, and with some of the drugs, maybe we can improve your bone density over time. But prevention is really the important piece. Calcium, vitamin D, exercise, stop smoking, drink less. So there are a couple of things we do. Depending on your scores, we either focus on your building blocks of bone, make sure you're exercising with weight-bearing exercise, and of course, safety in the home. Always make sure your glasses are up to date, make sure your hearing's up to date, don't have loose rugs in the house, don't wear slippery socks on wood floors, those kinds of things. Don't walk on uneven ground. Yes? How accurate is the DEXA if you have like a traumatic compression fracture? Traumatic compression fractures don't count as osteoporosis. If you get in a... Well, people with scoliosis tend to have more issues with their back. They do. But so, still yeah, it's still okay to get a bone density if you have scoliosis. In fact, some people don't even know they have a little bit of scoliosis until we do their DEXA, their bone density exam, and then we say, oh, yeah, I got a nice little curve there. Okay. Um, or, depending on your scores, maybe we need the building blocks, we need the safety, we need the exercise, and we need some medicine. Okay. Okay, so your first building block is calcium. Calcium is your friend unless you have kidney stone history. <laughs> we don't usually pump our folks full of calcium if they get kidney stones, okay, because if they're calcium containing kidney stones. We need calcium for life. Calcium does lots of things. It builds bone, keeps them healthy. It helps your blood make clots to prevent you from bleeding. It um, helps your nerves send messages. It helps your muscles contract. So it's an important mineral in your body, okay? And we don't make it. Our bodies don't create calcium, so we have to get it from outside sources, okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh, will you hit upon the new uh, thing to drink almond or those different milks? Most of the almond milks and the other soy milks also contain calcium. You can do whatever makes your gut happy, as long as you're getting the calcium that you need based on your age, and we'll, and we'll hit that. Um, the current guidelines, remember National Osteoporosis Foundation, they're the gurus, they say 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams a day for, for women. We'll go through it more specifically, but that's average. If we have more than 1,500 milligrams in a day, that sets you up for the possibility of developing atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries and your cardiologist and you for that matter don't want that okay that's plaque in the blood vessels so that's why sometimes we have a little bit of a tug of war with cardiology and family practice on calcium but we tell them it's okay as long as we're not getting more than 1500 milligrams okay you can get it through your diet or you can get it through supplements Okay. If you have kidney stone history, calcium containing kidney stones, you'll want to choose mostly dietary calcium. We don't encourage supplemental pill form calcium in, in that situation. Okay, so I made a little chart. There are different formulations of calcium that are available over the counter. Calcium carbonate is one, but sometimes it causes constipation and gas. So we tend to vote for calcium citrate. That's the Citricol is the brand name, but it's available in the generic form as calcium citrate. It tends to be less constipating, and it doesn't require acid in the stomach. So people who have to take Prilosec or Pepsid or those things that reduce acid in the stomach, calcium citrate is better for them because they have less acid, and calcium citrate doesn't need it to be absorbed. Um, calcium lactate, we really don't see that very much at all. I included it just in case anybody happened to be taking one, but it might cause some diarrhea. And then calcium gluconate, a little less constipating, but generally you won't find that over the counter. It's mostly going to be calcium carbonate, calcium citrate. And I've heard that you're supposed to take it at night? Um, actually, we have our patients take calcium in split doses, once in the morning, once in the evening. If you're taking the calcium citrate with vitamin D like I do with the 1,200 milligrams? 
Okay? That's the extended release formula, once a day. So, evening is okay? Evening's fine. Yep. No, no restrictions on that. Okay, so how much do you need? Women under age 50, about 1,000 milligrams a day. Women 50 and older, 1,200 milligrams a day. Men under, remember, here's that magic number, that's 70, 71. Men under 71, 1,000. Men over 71, about 1,200. And I'm going to show you how you can get it. Okay, so if you choose to do mostly dietary intake of calcium, you can read your labels. On the bottom, if I'll have you look at the bottom, your food label, if it says 30% daily value, now that's based on 1,000 milligrams a day, so keep that in mind. 30% means that product has about 300 milligrams, okay? 20% daily value has about 200 milligrams, and so on. But here are some pretty average dietary intake sources. Milk, of course, but as you saw from the original slides, there's a lot of folks out there with lactose intolerance. So they are drinking the soy milk and they're drinking the almond milk, but those are fortified with calcium. You just have to read the label. I think they're putting in just about the same amount as regular cow's milk. So an eight ounce glass of milk is 300 milligrams of calcium. So is a container of yogurt. So is an ounce of cheese. The harder cheese have more calcium. Although, I don't think of Swiss as a hard cheese, but I guess it is. Brie is soft, Swiss is not, I guess. Dark leafy greens, so broccoli is your friend in terms of calcium. Yes, ma'am. I don't know the answer. I should have looked that up. I think it sh spinach shrinks, but broccoli stays about the same. I don't know. <laughs> Total brand cereal. This is my favorite for people who don't like milk very much and who, who maybe are snackers. A three-quarter cup of total brand, total of cereal, has a thousand milligrams of calcium. Three-quarter cup is not much cereal. Most people pour an easy cup in their bowl, maybe a cup and a half, depending on how much they love their breakfast. If they're a snacker, what's that? Three three-quarter cup of total brand cereal, thousand milligrams. Um, I tell them pour it in a bag and eat them like chips throughout the day the little bran flakes. I love that. Or throw them in your yogurt. If you can't stand milk but you like yogurt, make them crunchy in your um, yogurt with some of that. Fortified orange juice, fortified with calcium. Most of them have calcium and vitamin D. An eight ounce glass is 300 to 500 depending on your orange juice itself. Now, most people drink only about a six ounce glass of orange juice. Keep that in mind. And if you have a stomach that doesn't tolerate the acid, that's not a choice for you. Soybeans, here in Nebraska we like soybeans, right? A cup of those is 260 milligrams. However, I'm not sure that anybody really eats that much in one setting, but that's something to know. And then a bowl of ice cream, I get all sorts of ice cream confessions in my office. A cup of it is 100 milligrams. So not a, not a calcium dense um, serving, but a comfort food. That's what my patient told me today. It's my comfort food. I said, that's okay. Um, the Greek yogurts are, are fortified just the same. So they should have about, although some of them seem like they're larger portions, like closer to eight ounces, and they might be, but they should have about the same. And remember to read your label. <laughs> Six ounces usually has about 300. Okay. So if the label says 30%, then it's about 300. Okay. Uh huh. So then calcium's best friend is vitamin D because vitamin D helps calcium get absorbed. There's not a lot of really good dietary sources of vitamin D, however. Most of it comes from our exposure to sunlight. In Nebraska, though, when we have winter, 
most of us in our geographic zone have vitamin D deficiency because we just don't have enough exposure to sunlight <coughs> and you know we're not supposed to be out in the sun for long periods of time right because then we get too much sun and we get skin cancer you know that's a little bit of a double-edged sword right so we always recommend a vitamin D supplement National Osteoporosis Foundation again the gurus they recommend 800 to 1,000 international units, that's how it's measured, each day. However, when we test our folks who are getting their bone density taken care of, we often find that they're vitamin D deficient and actually need more than 1,000. Now, most calcium tablets come with vitamin D in them. I will tell you that most calcium is either 500 or 600 plus about 400 international units of vitamin D so that you're getting, by the time you take your morning and your evening, you're getting 1,200 of calcium and you're getting 800 of vitamin D. But most of our folks require another 1,000 or more of vitamin D each day. Your insurance companies will let you have vitamin D screening once a year. And you should get one as part of your regular uh, well person physical each year. <coughs> Salmon and mackerel have vitamin D, but you know, I don't think anybody's eating that every day. Um, some of the cereals are fortified with vitamin D also, so they're a source. I didn't look at the vitamin D content on the total box, but I bet that's good. So then the question is, when do we treat osteoporosis? Do we treat osteopenia? If you have a hip or a spine fracture, a vertebra fracture, or you have a T-score, remember the arrow, minus 2.5 or worse, you need treatment, okay, with medicine. If you have osteopenia, which is that yellow zone, minus 1 up to a minus 2.5, and you've had a fragility fracture, we want to treat you. If you have that middle range T-score and your FRAC score is elevated more than 20% for any fracture, any major osteoporotic fracture, or more than 3% for a hip fracture, remember that FRAX was that calculation tool, then we want to treat you. If you have other secondary causes for low bone mass like your medicines, such as high dose prednisone, prednisone longer than three months, things like that, then and a high frax, then we want to treat you, okay? So there are some situations when your score may not be minus 2.5, but we want to treat you because of these other pieces. Um, may I ask yes. What, what kind of medicines you would treat with and what are they to do? That's the next set of slides. Yep. Okay, um, before we get to the actual medicines, we have goals for what do we want to accomplish by treating you. If your treatment was started because you had a hip or a spine fracture, then our goal is to keep you fracture free for five to 10 years. And I'll show you something about fractures in a minute because that's meaningful after I show you the next slide. If your treatment was started because of osteoporosis at your spine, then your goal is to be fracture free for five years and to get your T-score back into the yellow zone, okay? If your treatment was started because of osteoporosis at the hip, then your goal is fracture-free at least five years and to get your T-score back in the yellow zone. If it was started because of osteopenia and a high fracture risk, then our goal is to get your fracture risk improved. Now that may vary by provider, but that's kind of the latest and greatest. What's the goals for me? And we'll get to that too. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Different than osteoporosis. Oh, it's entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, compression fracture is different than degenerative disc disease. That's really just osteo osteoarthritis of the spine. Different than compression or weakening from osteopenia or osteoporosis. Yep. Okay, so here's what I was saying about fracture risk. Remember, we wanted to keep you fracture free for the next five to 10 years, five years on a lot of those. It's because your risk for fracture declines, 
I don't think the word by is supposed to be there. Five to 15 years after your initial clinical fracture. I should have looked at that sentence better. It doesn't, it's, it's not clicking for me right now. Okay, um, because most 40 to 50% of new fractures occur within the first two years after the initial fracture. And then in most cases, the year absolute fracture risk after 10 years isn't elevated anymore. So if we can protect you for that five to 10 years, that's awesome. Maybe you won't have another fracture, okay? I don't know what I did with that first sentence, so just ignore it. Okay, so there's lots of different ways that we treat osteoporosis, and that may vary by provider, um, by specialty, by patient, by what you've had before, by what you can take, by what you can tolerate. Um, first one is estrogen, and we'll have a slide for each of these, so don't, don't worry about that. There's estrogen, there's a selective estrogen modulator, there's the anti-resorptives, and those prevent bone resorption. Remember, that's the scooping up the old guys and getting rid of them. That's the resorption. And can help increase bone mass. Those include the bisphosphonates, which are alendronate, abandronate, residronate, zoledronic acid. We'll talk about each of those. They each have their own slide. Prolia, which is one of the newer guys on the block. And then an anabolic agent, which is actually um, teraparatide, which is a parathyroid hormone. Uh, that one's not indicated for everyone. That one has its special indications, and that's called Forteo. Okay, so lots of talk about estrogen and hormone replacement therapy. So when you're getting into menopause and you're finding the symptoms of menopause intolerable, a lot of times you'll be started on a hormone replacement therapy, estrogen plus progesterone. It's been shown to decrease the risk of bone loss and then subsequently reduce the risk of fractures in women. The goal, though, should be the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time possible because of the other risk factors that come with hormone replacement. Breast cancer, blood clots, cardiovascular disease, things like that. Breast cancer, stroke, heart attacks, blood clots. Is that just with estrogen or the combination? I don't think anybody uses plain estrogen anymore. I think most of them use the combination. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's been a lot of change in thinking on hormone replacement therapy over time. So, you know, I'm not a women's health care provider, so um, they're the experts there. Okay. Then there are the selective estrogen receptor modulators, and there's really just the one, Evista. We're using that are with ladies that don't have high, high risk for fracture, that has some osteoporosis, or are ladies that completed five years of the other therapy, a lot of times we'll switch over to Evista. Maybe we'll start with Evista, depending on the T-scores and the FRAC scores, okay? That one mimics estrogen's good side and leaves its bad side off, okay? So there isn't those risk factors. However, if you're high risk for blood clot, we still don't like to use it. If you travel, maybe you drive eight hours um, to see your mother and care for her every single week. Well, that raises your risk for blood clots from immobility in the car. So we probably wouldn't use Evista for you. Maybe you're a world traveler and you're rocketing around on airplanes many times um, in a month. Probably won't use Evista with you because we just don't want to play with that risk of blood clot. All right, so our first bisphosphonate, the one we use the most is Fosamax, or its generic name is Alendronate. You may have been on it yourself. You may have a girlfriend that's been on it. You may have a dad that's been on it. It's, um, it's the one that we use the most, Dr. Valentin and myself. There are the others, and I'll continue to talk about them, but generally, we just use Alendronate, okay? So it's approved for treatment of osteoporosis in the postmenopausal women. It's approved for osteoporosis in men. It's approved for osteoporosis due to the steroid-induced osteoporosis. And it's taken once a week, and we usually give it just for five years, okay? There are special ways that have to be, um, the medicine has to be taken, and I'll talk about that a little bit, because there are some contraindications for some people. Um, the next one is Actinel or Residronate. 
This one's also indicated for women, postmenopausal women with osteoporosis, osteoporosis in men, osteoporosis due to the steroid induced, and it's taken once a month. Um, it can be available in a once daily formulation and a once weekly. We don't use it that much. I think maybe in three years with Dr. Valenti, I think I've probably seen five, most 10 patients on it. We just don't use it. It doesn't have the long life in the bone like alendronate does, so it's very short acting. <clears throat> uh, Bandronate or Boniva, you've probably seen commercials for this because I think Sally Field is the Boniva representative. It's for osteoporosis in the postmenopausal woman, and it's taken once monthly by pill or it's given by infusion. I don't believe we're doing infusion Boniva anymore. I don't think so. But again, maybe two or three people on Boniva on, on my service. Are they, is there side effects? Yeah. Is that, is that they, um, yep, coming up. <laughs> okay, um, this, there was other one that we use a lot is called zoledronic acid. And this is also bisphosphonate like the other, so anti-resorptive, so it's preventing the absorption of the, the senior cells and letting them stay in the bone longer. Because remember at the beginning, what happens in osteoporosis is the, the senior cells are getting reabsorbed quickly, faster than the new guys can come in to lay down new bone, leaving you with pits. These drugs slow down that absorption. They're anti-resorptive. It is given by IV. It is given once a year for a total of three years, period, the end easy to use, easy to get, as long as you have good kidney function. It's a great product for individuals who have had a compression fracture because we found that actually it may help reduce the pain related to osteoporosis compression fractures. That's not, it's not labeled that way, but we've seen it. It's not indicated for that and should not be given more than three years in a row. There are certain situations, however, and some of that is in uh, breast cancer therapy. Sometimes we give it the whole time, once a year, the whole time they're on their chemo. But what do they change you to? We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really nice drug for people who have difficulty swallowing because alendronate has to be swallowed all the way down. Or else, if it sticks in the esophagus, it can cause erosions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So our folks with scleroderma, for instance, that have terrible swallow or have, there, you probably know people that have to get their esophagus stretched out every once in a while. Those people are not good candidates for alendronate or the others because they need to get that pill all the way down. So this drug is great for them because it's given through the IV. We bypass the whole throat problem. Okay, what are the risks for bisphosphonate therapy? Osteonecrosis of the jaw. That is poor healing of the jaw bones after instrumentation to the jaw. If you go in and you have to have work done like a dental implant, if you're already getting bisphosphonate therapy, you may not heal as well. And your jawbone could, it's osteonecrosis technically is death of the bone, but your dentist should know that you're taking it. Your dentist should plan any treatment according to your dosing schedule. He should have you holding your bisphosphonate for a period of time before that surgery. And then he should be checking you very regularly, like once a week to make sure that your jaw is healing if you have to have something like this done while you are receiving bisphosphonate therapy. If you are on the zoledronic acid, we like you to time it at the end of your year before your next one, you know, a month or so before your next one so that your drug level is low and then we have you wait a little while afterwards to make sure you're healing good before we give you the next one. You have to have good, good, good dental hygiene. Okay. Now the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw at the doses that are recommended for osteoporosis, it's actually very low. But I'll tell you, it happens. It does. And sometimes it's inevitable. 
but we do our best with the good dental care and good scheduling to avoid it. Because remember, the whole idea of the drug is to slow down the, the turnover, old to new, old to new, old to new. And so when we're doing that, then your body can't generate and heal. So we're interfering with that. The other risk fracture is atypical fracture of the femur. The femur is the long leg bone of the thigh. It is a fracture that happens at the mid shaft. Okay? It's usually only after prolonged therapy. We only do five years. Since I've been with Dr. Valente, I've seen two people with atypical femur fracture that came to us okay, after having been on a Lendronate or one of the others for 10 to 14 years longer than we use it for. But so our patients that we have on it, it hasn't happened to, but sometimes they've come to us like that. And it is the one lady was just walking along on the track, her leg snapped, okay? It's, it's atypical because it's happening at the mid shaft and it's happening just out of nowhere, okay? But that typically only happens after way long amounts of time, longer than what we use our bisphosphonate therapy for. There is a risk for the esophageal erosions, like I was talking about with the swallowing pill, not with the IV one. Notice this though, your risk for atypical femur fracture is much lower compared to the number of fracture that the bisphosphonates prevent. So there's that risk benefit piece. Um, again, particularly with the lendronate, you have to get up first thing in the morning before you have any food or any drink. You have to swallow that alendronate down with a full glass of room temperature water and stay upright for 30 minutes before you take any other food or drink. You have to wait another 30 minutes. So people who take thyroid pills have trouble with this because, you know, thyroid is the boss and your, and your thyroid prescribing provider will assure you assure that you know that it needs to be taken all by itself and that you need to have this block of time around it. So it gets kind of difficult. A lot of times I'll have my ladies and men who take thyroid see if their endocrinologist or primary care provider will let them take it at night. Some of them do. Okay, with alendronate, Fosamax, it stays in your bone for 10 years. It likes it. That's why after five years of alendronate, we give you a break. We let you take a holiday. And we wait three to five years, and then we check your bone density again, and decide at that time whether we need to retreat or whether you're good for another couple of years. But we keep it just at five years, okay? And that's not true with abandronate or actinil because they, have, they don't live in the bone as long. Okay, here's your question about Prolia. Prolia is a newer drug. It's fully human monoclonal antibody. So it's kind of like in rheumatoid arthritis how we have our biologic agents. It's kind of like a biologic, if you want to say, for osteoporosis. It works against a protein that interferes with the survival of the bone resorbing cells. Those are called osteoclasts. So it doesn't let them stick around as much. So it inactivates them. It's approved for use in postmenopausal post women with high risk for fracture. It's approved for women and men at high risk of bone loss and fractures from the hormone depleting therapies like your chemotherapy for breast cancer and prostate cancer. <coughs> It's given as an injection under the skin, so subcutaneous, every six months, indefinitely. There's not an end to this one. It can make your calcium levels go really low, so we really got to make sure that your calcium is normal before you start your prolia. There may be an increased risk for infection when using this. We haven't seen that at all, but it's labeled that way, so we have to talk about that because it's an immune therapy. There is rare reports of that osteonecrosis in the jaw with it. Yes. Okay.
Okay, that's a, an interesting symptom. I haven't actually heard that one, but a lot of people complain about in pain. Maybe that's just where you're feeling it. If your dentist is checking you every six months, you should be okay. Usually it's only if the jawbone is manipulated. So, so. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Interesting piece. It's something to talk about with your dentist for sure. Um, yes. Okay. So that yellow zone. Yes, the yellow mm -hmm. zone. And she said that her doctor, her OBGYN, uh -huh. uh, prescribed Prolia for her. Interesting. Possibly um, pain in the bones and uh -huh. possible nausea. Yep. As the, uh, so when we effects. yep. So when we give um, a, a medication that interferes with our with our bone turnover. A lot of times we can get some bone aches. Usually it goes away within a week. Does it go away then? You can usually. Take this mm -hmm. and it would mm -hmm. We usually just recommend some Tylenol. And she said, um, also, and I've seen a toothbrush that's been prescribed for her, and it's been prescribed for her. Blythe Danner. Uh, She's the rep. Okay, it's the blonde lady mm -hmm. that says I'm a grandmother. Yep. And the prolia. Mm -hmm. And then there's all these pages of this and that. So yep, yeah, Blythe Danner is their rep. Okay, I, I've seen that. Uh, obviously, she must be taking it or they're paying her a bunch of money. <laughs> yeah. Money. One never knows. But um, is this unusual for, because I just, re I have, in fact, I have my bone density scan with me. Nice. From AMI. Uh -huh. I've had bone density scans since 2003. Okay. I had 13 hour back surgery in 2000. I had eight discs fused at one time. Ugh. 2003, and I've never had any, or 2000, I've never had anything since. And I've had six bone density scans uh -huh. at AMI since then. Of course, they can't do my back because of all, right. the, hardware. all the hardware. So it invalidates the, the spine. Right, the femur, and just uh, on July 7th, they had said uh, osteopenia, and I still can't figure out exactly what the NT score is, so I'm going to have to ask you later, but would Prolia be something for someone that has osteopenia? Um, if if they if they have ordered that, I'll be really surprised if your insurance company will approve that because it's hard enough for us to get them to pay for or to approve it even in osteoporosis sometimes unless we meet very strict criteria. So it's really not indicated okay. for osteopenia. It is for osteoporosis. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what the FDA has approved it for, and they'll fight you every bit of the way unless you prove and it. I have even, uh, you know, my doctor, my mm -hmm. provider uh -huh. downstairs hasn't sure. even talked, but I just was curious yep. for my friend's sake and for my sake. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. for more advanced problems. For osteoporosis. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Sometimes we're able to. Um, work a little bit with them. Say we have somebody with very high risk for fracture that maybe okay. just has osteopenia, very high risk for fracture, that can't take a lendronate because they can't swallow and they can't have zoledronic acid because they have bad kidneys. So in that case, the Prodelia is a nice drug and we would have to work with the insurance company to get special okay. approval for that. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, extra questions about Prolia? No? Okay. On one of these medications, and for some reason you end up switching your insurance provider, can they make you switch to a different medication? Generally not. Generally they don't, um, because most of them all. Oh, Steve, because uh, here he comes, my IT guy. Um, because most of them are fine with them. They're all okay. generic now. They usually don't fight as much at all on the oral one. Just don't. And. The zoledronic acid used to be called Reclass, but now it's generic and actually it's so cheap. I don't know why they don't have ever mass improvement. Uh, I've, I have a couple of people on our service. Um, a good candidate for it is somebody that had a cervical surgery, a neck surgery, and the bones didn't heal well because of their osteoporosis. Awesome candidate for Forteo. 
We have other people who have other intolerances that make them not able to have the other medications and, and have very high risk for fracture. Um, for instance, maybe they've had um, wounds in their feet that has migrated into the bone. You know, they have bone issues. That's a good candidate because we have, it, it's a bone growth um, agent too. So it's the only one, it's the only one that is capable of doing that. However, we have seen, though it's not labeled this way, we have seen prolia improve bone density. You know, usually all we're trying to do is prevent more bone loss. So if we can hold you that way and maybe get your T-scores a little better, that's great. Prolia is showing some promise there. Not anything like the Forteo, of course, because it's a totally different drug. But there is some promise. Now, which reminds me, what do we do after we've had that holiday? Well, sometimes we'll go back for a second course of the same drug, and sometimes we'll switch class. Like, maybe you had your alendronate for five years, you had your repeat bone density in three years, and we, we have some more bone loss again or our fracture risk remains high, or you've had a fracture, then we'll switch it to prolia. So every six months, usually in the back of the arm, the nurses give it in our clinic. It's not something you can do at home. They just won't allow it. Um, here's the piece about the Forteo. Um, I think this one's got a little more side effect panel, a little more common to have leg cramps, dizziness, nausea. There are some issues with your calcium. It can make your calcium go high because it's parathyroid hormone. So <clears throat> we have to be real careful with that. Um, calcitonin was used for a long time. Myocalcin, nasal spray, helped keep the calcium in the bones. No, I don't know if anybody uses it anymore, honestly. Um, strontium is not approved in the U.S. for osteoporosis. I do have a gentleman that takes it, but it's not prescribed by us for osteoporosis. But it's um, approved for postmenopausal osteoporosis in other countries. Down the line, maybe we'll get approved for it. And then on the horizon, you know, they're always trying to make new drugs that are better tolerated, last longer, do better things. There's a few things in the pipeline. They are, they break that coupling between the resorption and the formation. So we, we can increase our bone formation and we can, um, I lost my train of thought. We can slow down the bone resorption and we can create some new bone. So they're, what's cool about them is they're rapidly reversible. So say you decide that, uh-oh, I need to have my jaw surgery done. Well, this one's rap these are rapidly reversible, so we don't have to wait four months before you can have that surgery. Um, they increase the bone mass. Now, remember, because only right now, only Forteo does that. It's not stamped with that, approved for that. So these new drugs are showing that promise. These are in phase three clinical trials. They're not yet available. They haven't been approved for patient use yet outside of a clinical trial. Um, so they're highly effective and they have good safety profiles. One of them is a sclerostin inhibitor. Sclerostin inhibits bone formation. So if you inhibit the inhibitor, then you have the action that you want, right? Double negative? Okay. Um, Ramosazumab and blusozumab, hopefully they'll come up with something easier to say once they get approval. And then cathepsin K, that's an enzyme that's highly expressed in the osteoclast. Those are the cells that go in and, and resorb the bone cells. <clears throat> so it, it inhibits that enzyme. Also very promising. So Fosamax doesn't build bone? Fosamax is not labeled as a bone builder. It's not labeled as a bone builder. However, a lot of times we'll see that it improves bone density now, is it because of building new bone, or is it just because it slows down the bone resorption? It's just slowing down the bone resorption. It doesn't actually build the bone, create new bone. Forteo is a bone 
um, builder. <laughs> I'm getting tired, right? <laughs> Yes. Sentence, what's the difference between osteoporosis and osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is the wear and tear of joints in the body. It's uh, pain, stiffness, aches and pains of osteoarthritis. So you have some degradation of the cartilage and osteoarthritis. Osteoporosis, osteopenia is about the density inside the bones. Okay. So osteoarthritis is how they articulate together. Osteoporosis, osteopenia is about what's inside. Because remember, it's silent. Remember, because it's happening on the inside of your bones. You don't feel osteoporosis unless you have a fracture. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I have like two more slides, so let's whip through those and then you can ask away. Um, the good news is that it's not inevitable. You can do all of the preventive things to do what you can if you have risk factors, you know, ethnicity family history, gender, age, you still have all the good things like building blocks of bone, weight-bearing exercise, stopping smoking, drinking in moderation. And you're never too young or too old to protect your bones. So work with your teenagers, work with your young women, work with your friends to make sure you're all getting good building blocks of bone, you're doing your weight-bearing exercise, you're not smoking, you're not drinking heavily. Um, so start and or continue good lifestyle habits, all those things. I can't repeat those things enough. I talk about it all day long and I can talk about it all night too because they're so important. Good building blocks of bone, weight bearing exercise. Um, living with osteoporosis, these are kind of cool. In our patients with osteoporosis that are, are really kind of fragile folks, maybe they have balance problems, maybe they have weaknesses, these um, special pants, I don't know if you can tell from way back there, but these are basically like football pants with the pads over the bony prominences. So if they were to fall, they would land on the cushion. Okay, very nice. And I think they may use these in some nursing homes, okay, care centers. Um, okay, so if you have a little imbalance when you're walking, use a cane, use a walking stick, Walk with a friend, whatever it takes to keep you from falling. Make sure your friend is steady. <laughs> um, get rid of hazards in your home. The loose rugs, the slippery socks. Put some night lights in your hallways. <clears throat> um, don't have loose wires and cables. It's kind of like when you're in your younger years and you had to baby-proof things. It's the same thing. You're, a safety, you're safety-proofing your home. Um, grab bars in the bathroom non-skid mats, of course, in your, by your sinks and in your tubs. Everything to prevent fractures, falls, and disability. Because remember, breaking a hip is never a good thing. Um, well, sometimes everybody does fine, but their morbidity and mortality following a hip fracture is just high. Yeah, it's just terrible. <clears throat> so get help carrying or lifting items that are greater than 10 pounds if you have osteoporosis. Remember, because you can get a spinal fracture even without falling. You can get it just by lifting. I don't want to scare everybody. I mean, go ahead and pick up your grandchildren. It's okay, but just sit down to do it. And then wear sturdy shoes and shoes that grip. Okay, so we don't want you slipping and falling. And then for more information, talk to your rheumatology, rheumatology care provider, talk to your women's health care provider, talk to your primary care provider, your internist. Um, the National Osteoporosis Foundation, they have a very easy website, NOF, National Osteoporosis Foundation.org. And then um, the National Institutes of Health also has an osteoporosis section, osteo.org. So really easy to use websites. Okay, now I'll open it up for questions. Yes. Medicare will only let you have a bone density scan every two years, and that is to the day. If you had it on February 19th last year, you cannot have it until February 19th or 20th the next year. It's very, um, very tight. And the reason for that is not so terrible. The reason is that bone density doesn't change statistically significantly in periods shorter than two years. So it's kind of a waste of time to do it more frequently. Yes. Uh, 
Um, there is some discussion that you should limit your caffeine. Uh, you should limit your phosphorus dense things like soda pop because the phosphorus can not allow you to utilize your calcium properly because they, they're on an exchange system. Okay. Yes, sir. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, you should have a screening bone density exam. If you are on steroids, it should be early. If you're not on steroids, it should be just at standard time or a little bit earlier. I think we, we don't wait all the way till 65. We do most of our screening bone densities once our ladies are fully menopausal and our men, you know, 60, 65, we don't usually wait till 71 or whatever it says. Um, you can have normal bone density and then you don't have to have it repeated for 10 years in most people. We usually just go five years in our rheumatoid patients because of, again, your rheumatoid being an independent risk factor for osteoporosis. If you have osteopenia, the yellow zone, you should have one every two years. If you have osteoporosis, every two years. Sometimes we'll wait three after being on the holiday from a lendronate, for instance. But two, two or three, depending on your individual situation. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Sure. I would I would look at your fracture risk before making that decision. If your yeah, if your scores are in the yellow zone and your fracture risk is uh, you know maybe it's 21 and maybe it's three and a half, you know, just a teetering over. And if you want to make a conscientious effort to increase in your weight bearing exercise, building blocks of bone, avoiding your risks like smoking and alcohol, certainly. I mean, no, nobody can make you do anything. Yeah. We can just make the recommendations that are based on science. Are there certain exercises that are more beneficial? Walking. walking. Yeah. Walking is your fracture.